<clears throat> uh, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Um, someone be willing to read chapter 3 to us? I was listening and was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. And I declare to him, I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more. Also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Thank you. Um, so, obviously there's a lot in this passage. Um, and <clears throat> I want to focus on, so Eli's sons are priests who are laboring in the temple. But they are using their position as priests to basically satisfy their fleshly desires. They're stealing food in front of the people, much worse, they're abusing the women who are also serving in the temple. And the all of those things are terrible, but the massively aggravating factor to it is they're doing this in the name of the Lord, right? Um, anytime that we sin in God's, I mean, we bring disrepute on the Lord through our sin, but we really bring disrepute on the Lord when we sin in the Lord's name, right? We are 
all of us. I mean, the, the priests of the Lord, when they went in to minister into the temple, they would have to offer a sacrifice for themselves, for their own sin, right? It was acknowledged that there was never going to be a priest who was sinless before the Lord. <clears throat> what was important <clears throat> is that they acknowledged their sin, that they would seek to repent of their sin. To not acknowledge their sin and to use the Lord to satisfy their sinful desires is particularly heinous. There's a, there is a belief that's common in evangelicalism, and I don't have time to deeply go into it, um, but, uh, and, but I, I will tell you, not all sins are equal. We, we tend to want to think that all sins are equal because it's true any sin is enough to cast us into hell, but um, it's far more evil to murder someone than it is to yell at them when they cut you off in traffic, right? And yet they're both of the same kind, but one, and then likewise, when we begin to repent of sin, often as our sin dies, we manifest less and less severe uh, you know, instances of the sin as it dies, if that makes sense, right? So the person who used to throw a punch is now grumbling under their breath. Are they both sinful? Yes. Is a person being sanctified? Yes. Right? That's what God does, right? So it's not to excuse sin, but to recognize. <clears throat> and so these Eli's sons are particularly heinous. And so the question... <clears throat> And obviously, God is not happy with Eli because Eli has not restrained his sons. God is holding Eli accountable, um, not for his son's hearts, but for their behavior. And there's, you know, actually it talks about um, an officer in the church. There's a, there's a word that can be translated faith or faithful in Greek, um, and it it says that whose children, in some translations, will say believe, and then others will say children who are faithful. And I've, I've had people point out many times, we don't have any control over our children's hearts, <clears throat> but we do have substantial influence over their behavior. Matter of fact, sometimes the way we deal with our, their behavior is what the Lord uses on their hearts. Samuel has... I mean, uh, Eli has given up restraining his son's sin. And I believe that, I mean, he's old. He's also, we find out he's very, very heavy, right? So, I mean, you can totally picture him having diabetes, which is going to take out his eyes. Mm -hmm. But I think in the story here that his dim eyesight is also a picture of his spiritual condition. He is not completely blind, but his eyesight has grown dim, which is, that's how we are, right? When we're walking closely with the Lord, our eyesight becomes, spiritual eyesight becomes clearer. And when we're not, it's like our eyesight gets fuzzy, if that makes sense. His eyesight has grown dim, <clears throat> but he's not without faith because when Samuel receives this revelation from the Lord that judgment is going to fall on Eli's household, he accepts it. He, he knows. He's, he's not an unbeliever. He is a believer who has radically failed in what he was called to do. I think this is important for us to pay attention to because we live in a world of radical individuality. <clears throat> Not the entire world, but our world that we live in is a world of radical individuality. Um, the idea that a church, that fellow Christians are gonna get into someone's business is like a, is an offensive thought in our culture. Right? But sin that is permitted is sin that is condemned. Right? 
when we, and, and it's not that we are, have the same level of control over our brothers and sisters that we do over our children, and not that we have perfect control over our children, especially as they get older, <clears throat> but um, Eli was not addressing it at all. Throwing up his hands. Sin that is permitted is sin that is condoned. Responsibility falls on him, not for his kids' hearts, but for his inaction in the face of their sin. This is, this is hard stuff, right? I mean, I mean, it's hard stuff for me. I, I'm not saying, oh, this is hard stuff for you, and it's not hard. This is hard stuff for me because it is difficult. <clears throat> it's difficult to address our own sin. And then coming alongside other people and addressing other things is even more difficult. It's even more difficult sometimes to address sins in leadership. And there, there, there tends to be, let me tell you how this tends to work. Um, we tend to be most comfortable in addressing the sin of the people with the least power. comfortable addressing the sin of the people with the least power. You see this in our culture. Who are the people who get the toughest sentences? People with the least power, right? But we, we all function like that. Like in a church, the hardest sins to deal with are the sins in leadership, which is why like those are the ones we have to deal with, right? The people who have to be accountable. It has to flow down. It can't flow up. It can't flow upstream. It has to flow downstream. <clears throat> From the top, have to be accountable, flowing down. And his refusal to discipline is going to bring uh, condemnation on his house, which he accepts. Now, we're going to find out later that Samuel's kids are not awesome either. Okay. Now, I want to kind of pull up to like 30,000 feet here. <clears throat> Samuel is a prophet. We'll find he's a priest and he's a judge. Right? He's the last of the judges. And he um, is going to be the one who anoints to king. Okay. Saul, and then David. David, man after God's own heart. We find out David is going to be a prophet, right? He writes the lion's share of the book of Psalms. He's a king, but he's not a priest. Not a priest. In some ways, he's almost a priest, but he's not a priest, right? Jesus is our prophet our priest and our king. These are the three saving offices of the Old Testament. And judge. Yeah, he is our judge, right? Prophet, priest, king, judge, and wise man. <laughs> um, but prophet, priest, and king are the three saving offices. That's what saves us. Christ being our prophet, priest, and king. Samuel, who is faithful, who is after God's heart, um, is not perfect and does not fulfill these offices, all of them. And he anoints David, and David is a man after God's own heart, and then we're going to, we will see that he is going to, I mean, he's going to be like wreck, just total wreckage through his family, even though he loves the Lord, and even though he repents, he is not going to be enough. Samuel is... Uh, is very much the type of John the Baptist, right? He's from a righteous family. He's from a barren mother. He has a priestly background. Um, he's a Nazarite. Uh, both, his song, both their parents sang songs of praise and both prepared the way for the anointed one, right? But Samuel is preparing the way for an earthly king. And an earthly king will never, ever fill what we need. Actually, 
This is the problem we have disciplining leaders, is we want them to be more than earthly people, right? We want them to be more than a pastor, or more than a president, or, you know, we want them to save us. But the only one who can save us is Christ, right? He is, he is the only one who can fulfill that for us. When we put people, when <clears throat> you're going to rely on Eli to do it, no, he's going to fail. You're going to rely on Samuel to do it. He seems like a pretty good, he's not going to be able to do it, but he's going to anoint David, and David is awesome. I mean, David, as a shepherd boy, had his, his lamb snatched by a lion. He killed the lion and retrieved the lamb. But he's not enough. He's not enough. Only Christ is enough. And it's somewhere in taking that focus off of God and putting it on people, having that shift going from Christ is the one who saves me and meets my needs to this person is the person who saves me and meets these needs. That is where things go terribly, terribly wrong. Just, you're talking about, um, you know, my, my wife yesterday was like, oh, you are in a bad mood. Like, you just, you know, and I, and, and I'm, my bad mood is nowhere near like the stuff that was like grinding in my heart, you know, just, you know, resentment and grumbling and stuff like that. I'm being tame out here, you know, but I'm moderating it. And then you're talking, Steve, about, you know, that Jesus is, um, is going to the cross. And he's just pouring compassion out. I'm sitting in the chair going, ugh, you know. Like, I, I have too much painting to do at my house. And I'm like compassion is like now in dimples that's all I got because I got painting to do like what is what because Christ is the only one who ultimately meets our needs and the people who are faithful are the people who point us to him and lead us to him not who take the place of him Does that make sense? I don't know if that connection makes sense for me. <laughs> it makes sense for me a lot. Um, that everything going on with Samuel and then with David is just pointing forward. You need something better. You need the real king. You need the final prophet. You need the priest who connects you with God himself, right? We, uh, when we teach children, teach Sunday school, teach our own kids, um, preach, evangelize, all those things, all we're doing, we're not connecting someone with God, we're connecting them with the person who connects them with God, Jesus Christ and himself. Um, If when Jesus rode into the city, humble on a donkey, and received adulation, people aren't thinking, this guy's about to die. Like he's, he's really the only one who knows. You know? um, but he would. What is he heading for? He's heading to his enthronement as our king, dying in our place. That's what he's heading for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would lift up our hearts to your son. Pray that you would redirect our trust in people. Father, we pray that you would allow us um, to see sin for what it is 
and see our need for what it is and grow in our love for you and compassion towards one another. Father, again, we lift up our brothers and sisters who are worshiping in another building this morning because it's too much to worship with the blood of their precious ones was spilled. Father, we pray that you'd pour out your blessing on them at Covenant Presbyterian today. In the name of Christ our King. Amen.